I'm standing here with my good friend, David Delagardel, formerly of the Mad Dwarf Workshop, now of his own uh, lone artistic sword path, Cedar Lore Forge. Uh, Dave is an amazing artist. I've always admired his work. If you, uh, if you see any shots of my shop, you're going to see, you know, Photos of his drawings blown up on my wall for inspiration. Um, he's a humble guy, but his work is incredible. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his art and how uh, digital art uh, can be used to enhance and uh, speak to the actual production of these uh, wonderful things he makes. And uh, for those of you waiting, finally, for the trivia question, it's still not <laughs> Take it away, Dave. Cool. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, like Dave says, my name is David Delagardell. Uh, I'm a swordsmith and artist from Muncie, Indiana. Um, uh, when Dave asked me to speak at this event, I was obviously humbled and honored and overwhelmed because I'm speaking with, alongside the guys who got me into the craft and inspired me so much and have taught me everything I know. I was also kind of a conundrum thinking, hmm, what am I going to speak about uh, that would be new or uh, you know, refreshing to the guys who taught me everything? What can I really share that they don't already know? Um, and it was a funny moment when I realized I should probably go back to my roots. Um, before I stumbled into bladesmithing, my passion growing up was always uh, illustration and graphic design, um, you know, with a, with a desire to work on films and do stuff for books and magazines. Um, and even though I'm still a bladesmith today and I'm attempting to follow that path, um, I also do that work. Um, I've had the uh, awesome opportunities and a lot of blessings to, to do things for magazines and books uh, and films. Um, and uh, I went to school for that. I did some studying graphic design. Um, and once I got into bladesmithing, I didn't scrap all the things I learned. I, I tried to apply it. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about sword rendering. Um, I, I kind of developed my own weird method and style <laughs> in Photoshop about how I uh, designed my swords. Um, I actually haven't been formally trained in Photoshop. It's just as a preface to all people watching, there's, probably, there's definitely people out there who know Photoshop way better than I do who will be saying, oh, you could do that so much easier if you would click this or do that. I know, I apologize, um, but everybody obviously has their own way in Photoshop. Uh, I also want to have to move pretty fast. Um, I wish I could obviously say, I'm pressing this button now, I'm doing this, but I have to work under the assumption that you, you know, understand the basics of Photoshop and the tools that it comes with. Um, uh, and I think it'll just make the process a lot easier and be a lot of fun. So I'll dive right in and show you what I got. Um, in terms of sword design, uh, I've obviously learned so much from, from the men who you've already heard from and I'm continuing to learn. Uh, growing up, I was very uh, just kind of intuitive in, in what I did. Uh, we've talked a lot about um, Peter and Jake uh, and you will have talked a lot about studying historical designs. Um, and that's one thing uh, my, my good friend Andy Davis and I have had the awesome opportunity to do firsthand. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool. We, we've thrown around the word mythopoetic a lot uh, in the past couple days. Uh, and that's a word I'm learning what it means. I think one of the, one of the meanings of it is uh, taking the you know, history, the culture that you know and love and can relate to, and kind of just marinating in it. Um, even if you're not going to uh, reproduce exact historical swords, um, you can take the, the things that really speak to you and filter them through uh, your inspirational lens, uh, and it can speak volumes. So um, here's some photos uh, that Andy and I took when we uh, had the opportunity to go to the Fraser Arms Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, handle some really beautiful originals that uh, are totally inspiring. And um, it was awesome. Um, now these, you know, we obviously got to hold a lot of historical swords, um, but I am going on a path now where I would like to strictly make more, you could say, fantasy or mythic designs. Um, However, you know, no matter how fantasy, no matter how Tolkien-esque or whatever they are, it's still healthy and good to have them anchored uh, in history and take your, your inclinations from there. So that's definitely uh, where I come from when it begins with sword design. Um, now, even though what I'm going to be showing you today is primarily digital, I by no means am going to be one of those weird snobby guys who says, oh, digital's way better, you know, scrap all the old... I'm a placement. I love old things. So, you know, I've got my sketchbook. Even if I design a sword... Uh, for a customer or for uh, production, uh, I'm still going to start with a sketch. And it's going to be very rough, very intuitive. I'm actually, I'm not, I'm not even going to think about it much. I'm just going to dive right in um, and uh, end up with a, with a rough sketch before I get into the digital realm. So I by no means I'm going to say digital is better. It's not. It's just one, one side of the coin. Uh, and, it, and it can help you do things you obviously can't do with your hands on a, on a piece of paper. Um, 
So, you know, after you know, digesting a lot of historical designs, I'll uh, very intuitively sketch things out. Um, uh, and a lot of these, you know, were drawn with uh, pen and paper and then scanned into Photoshop and tweaked. Um, once I do that, you know, I have my very rough, rough designs, then I'll, I'll enter Photoshop. Um, here's some examples of what I'm going to be showing you today. Um, when Andy and I first started our, our, our bladesmithing studio, we were, you know, still young guys learning. Um, we definitely, uh, you know, took the approach that we wanted to learn more and uh, work on our design skills before we, you know, you know uh, hit hammer against steel. And when we'd get commissions and people would come to us uh, wanting to place an order, um, I had to find a way to work out these designs with people. Um, you know, if people, someone can describe a beautiful sword in an email or call you on the phone, but obviously you want to know what they're talking about and be on the same page with them uh, before they start sending you money and you start working on their design. Um, and this is one of the reasons I'm really excited about showing this today is because this is obviously very um, practical and helpful for us as sword makers or if you're a knife maker. Um, it's also really fun and cool if you're just uh, a person who appreciates art and uh, appreciates swords and you want to design your own. Um, if, uh, you know, if you're not a swordsmith, if you have no intentions of ever enter enter entering a shop and doing metalsmithing yourself, if you work on a production and you, you get called to design swords, uh, you know, props, or even if they're made in plastic, um, I, I hope the skills that I'm going to show you are practical enough to where they could be applied to that. They definitely came in handy um, with Andy and I when we got the opportunity to work on Thor, um, which was a pretty crazy, uh, overwhelming project. Uh, uh, <laughs> still this day I have mixed feelings about, but you know, we were blessed to work on it. And um, I'm working on another production uh, currently called The Narrow Road, which is based off the book Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, which is a lot more liberating because I have some freedom. I can take a lot more historical designs. Uh, even though I'm uh, one of the main artists on this upcoming film, um, you still have to work really, really fast. And that's one of the pluses of a digital medium. Once you understand the tools, just like in your own shop, you know how your grinder works, you know how your uh, whatever works. Um, once you know the tools of Photoshop, you can just attack it and not think about what you're doing. Um, and, and the designs can just flow out of you really easily. Um, so the design that I'm going to be uh, whipping up today is uh, based off of this. I had a gentleman uh, contact me the other day saying he saw this uh, little old sketch I did on my website. I think I had to draw it like back in high school or something, and he, he said he really liked this one particular sword and, and uh, wants to commission it from me. Uh, I said yes. I uh, thought it was really cool. I'm excited about it. Um, but now I'm at the stage where I have to backtrack and remember, what was I thinking when I was drawing this? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but that's a fun process. I kind of like just intuitively, you know, e exploding ideas on, on paper, leaving it behind, and uh, coming back to it later to explore. You know, what, what was going through my mind? What kind of culture would this be? I don't really know yet, but um, that's what I'm going to find out with you guys. Um, so here is where I can begin on the practicals. So I'll fire up Photoshop. And... Um, like I said, I'm a very intuitive designer. I just kind of attack things uh, with a vengeance. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a numbers person. <laughs> I'm not a very analytical person, so I'm learning a lot from the other perspectives here. You know, Peter Johnson obviously hasn't even shown everything about his uh, incredible things he's discovered with the historical proportions of swords. Um, and I, I'm going to try in the future to apply the, uh, you know, these very true rules uh, to sword design, um, especially when it comes to Photoshop. Um, I do a little bit of, of sizing uh, if I, I'm, you know, I made the, make the canvas to uh, start designing it. And I'm going to go to image, image size, pixels. Actually, let's go to canvas size. Um, the height of this is 56-ish inches, 17 inches wide. Definitely a pretty big sword, but if, if I work under the perimeters of, of this canvas I have, um, it's going to be a roughly life-size scale. Um, so... I can start in a very strange way, but it's the way my brain understands it, and I start with the blade. Um, if you've ever, I, I almost feel like, I don't, I, there's probably a term for this, but I feel like travel back to your preschool, elementary school days, if you took a piece of paper, folded it in half, and started cutting shapes into it, you know, you ob obviously have a mirror image. It's kind of the way I approach Photoshop. Um, I get, you know, the cutting tools, I'll work on the corner. Um, Go down to the canvas, the base. Got my circle tool. 
I'm going to cut out a sliver if I can do that. And let's see here. Well, I'm actually going to first just show you practically what it looks like when you do that. Um, I, can, I cut out one side of the blade and I can, I can work on the proportions and I'll flip it, I'll rotate it. Um, so I, I come up with something like this. Um, it's rough, you know, I can work on the proportions. You can uh, go free transform um, if you're selected on the right layer. Edit free transform and change the size, change the dimensions. Um, once you have a shape you like, uh, then it can, you can, you can work in two dimensional, you can, if you don't want to worry about textures and colors, that's fine. Obviously, uh, digital can very easily whip out flat color shapes where you just worry about proportions. Um, but uh, you can also do that with paper. I, I'm working in Photoshop because I want to show my customer or myself in planning the, the, the textures and the materials I want to work with. I want to explore those things now um, before I'm in the shop. So on this blade, for example, uh, one clever trick to just immediately make it look like a blade is to add a gradient overlay. Pop that on there. And then uh, there's a fun little tool called Bevel Emboss, which on most things look ugly, but when you apply it to a blade, voila, it somehow has a fuller out of nowhere. Um, it gets even goofier and a little bit more fun when at the scroll of a button you can change the size of the fuller, uh, make it a uh, concave, convex blade, uh, do stuff like that. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to scrap this and actually show you one I already have made. Um, and it doesn't take much time at all. Uh, copy and pasted layers above it, uh, flipped it to make it look like a fuller so the light's in the right direction. And uh, I've got my blade set up. Um, so moving on to the guard, I'm going to try and show you what I meant earlier by the kind of whole paper cutout mentality. I'm going to go back to, let's see, uh, free transform cutting tool. And I'm just going to wing it. Um, draw out a random guard, and of course it looks beautifully ugly, but this will this will suffice. Um, I'm going to copy. Now it's invisible because it's the same color as the background, but I'm going to make it black so you can see what I'm doing. Darken that up. Edit free transform. Bring it over. I'm going to copy that layer. Flip the layer select it, line it up, and I have a very ugly looking guard, but <laughs> it shows you, it shows you um, what I'm talking about, and that's the same way I approach the blade. Um, I also have a nice little gap there, but it still works for my illustration. Um, get to squish it, change proportions. Um, I'll go in and add that same effect with the, uh, <laughs> you can add some nice bubbles to your cross guard if you like that on your swords. Um, Give it the gradient overlay. Like the <laughs> yeah, the bubbles. I should go back to the bubbles. Um, bevel emboss. And uh, you can just very quickly start to get something that has some dimension. Um, now, you're limited, obviously. I'm still I'm working in flat color shapes. This is kind of the way I think that a lot of graphic designers get the epic depth looking in their logos. Um, the Lord of the Rings logo looks like it was you know chiseled out of stone. I think it was simply done like this in Photoshop. Um, but if you want to get some more definition to it, we have to go into the realm of uh, texturing, which becomes a lot of fun. So I already have uh, this garden pommel made roughly uh, uh, to the right specifications of the sketch I did. Um, and it's still looking a little bit two-dimensional, flat and plain. The way we can mess with that is playing around with textures. Um, now, I like playing around with photographic textures and uh, uh, most of these I've photographed myself. Um, let's see, for example, uh, different types of curly woods, pattern welded steel. Uh, this was literally an old pizza pan I found at my house. I thought it was a good texture. <laughs> um, leather, brass, antler, uh, wood, simple stuff. Um, it's also important, I, I take this very seriously as an artist, uh, even if you're making just a render for yourself or just a customer, you're not going to put it online, still just work with your own images um, and just be respectful of other people. Um, you know, this, exam this was uh, Bill, I think Andy welded up and I just took a snap of in the shop um, because you never know, you know where your work is going to be and you want to be working with uh, your own materials, even if, it's, even if it's just digitally. Um, 
So, we're working on the guard. What we could we do? I'm going to take advantage of that little pizza pan, which has the slight effect of wrought iron that's been a little bit damaged here and there. I'm going to plop it into the same, same canvas. I'm going to make sure the layer is above my guard. Scale this down because it's a bit extreme. Bring it over here. Obviously covering up our guard, if I go back down to the guard layer, select pixels, you can see it revealing itself. I'm going to go back to the pizza pan layer, copy it, delete the layer underneath, and you've got a uh, kind of raw irony texture. Um, this is something I like to play around with, kind of clean, refined blades, and then really uh, rough uh, and organic uh, hilt materials. Um, I'm actually going to scrap that too, because I have a couple made. You know, I've got brass. I've got uh, more rot. Before I move on, um, obviously there's, there's base material textures, um, but then it goes into the realm of how do you want to decorate this? Um, so I've got textures uh, from old carvings I've already done. can recycle some of my, my own designs. Um, uh, uh, woodworking from friends of mine. Uh, historical designs off of uh, different um, Celtic crosses and, and whatnot. Stuff from the Staffordshire Horde. Um, this can be applied just like I apply that other texture, or if I go in here, select pixels, uh, we can have fun, not with textures, but just freestyling. Um, this is a Wacom tablet. I should probably elaborate on before I move on. I love a Wacom tablet. Um, it doesn't matter whether you consider yourself an artist or not. If you want to work uh, in Photoshop or with any, any uh, digital program to create, it's just such a fun tool. Um, uh, and it's really straightforward. It's the, my mouse is literally a pen. Um, the newer ones are pressure sensitive. I think when I bought this one, it was like $120, but you can literally get these things online used or old for 40, 50, 60 bucks. Um, so they're so worth it uh, if you want to do graphic design. Um, so let's see here. I, on this sword, um, talking about the design a little bit, I'm kind of finding the aesthetic um, definitely not historical here. I'm, I'm, I'm finding some really aggressive lines, and uh, I'm not seeing any kind of knot work on this. I want to, to, to follow through on that kind of geometric, aggressive, but still a little bit flowing organic theme. Um, so I'm going to, if, if I was going to uh, add any decoration or engravings or whatnot to the brass hilt, um, I can kind of play around with that uh, by using my brush. So throw designs in there. Scratch, scratch, whatever engravings you want. Um, or if you know you want it to be really ornate. The, the sky is literally the limit. I can give it definition, almost carve in a sense. You know, give highlights, shadows. Um, but I'm going to leave that aside. I'll be able to elaborate that a little, a little bit on that later. Um, I'm going to move on to the grip. And uh, th since this is a double-edged blade, uh, each element obviously needs to be mirror imaged and symmetrical. And uh, so at each stage, I'd be doing that cut out half, draw half of it, flip it, reverse it, put it together method. And that's what I did on the grip. Um, uh, playing back with the textures, you know, I can immediately just throw on hmm, would a, a certain type of pine look good? Would a, a redwood, a blackwood, a leather, antler? Uh, on this particular piece, I think antler would look cool. Um, still looks a little bit two-dimensional, even though it's a real image. So I'm going to go in here, uh, select it, get a dark brush color. Make sure the brush is the right size. And I'm just going to give it a little bit more definition. And of course, this, this, it, it, there's no limit to the detail you can put in. I mean, this can get kind of silly and time wasting depending on what you're doing. But, um, you know, if you're working on a really high-end commission for a customer, this is the stuff they really appreciate. And, uh, and they're, you know, um, for most designers, uh, bladesmiths and whatnot, willing to pay a little bit extra to see the piece before you start on it. And I think it's uh, um, a really kind thing to do for the person who's helping put food in your pantry. So I <laughs> uh, did that. And that's basically it. Um, I, I can do a little bit more. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go back to textures. If I wanted to do a pattern welded blade, let's find some of that uh, st 
steel that I photographed. Well, they're literally just going to take this, make sure I'm on the right layer down here, blade two, get rid of this guy, drag and drop. I'm going to first click overlay and immediately that texture is imposing itself onto the blade. It just kind of blends together. Drag it down. It's a little bit extreme, a little bit bold. I'm going to tone that down a bit because I don't think you'd want your Damascus to look like a zebra like that. Bring it down. Um, but immediately, you, it just has a little bit more of a photorealistic texture. Um, so again, this is, this is practical and helpful, um, you know, whether you're making a project for an individual person, a customer, especially practical on, you know, film productions, TV shows and whatnot. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, even if you're a random uh, appreciator of swords and artwork and graphic design. Um, you may be thinking now, maybe you say, I have no interest in Photoshop, I don't want to buy a Wacom tablet, I don't like numbers and, 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 and measurements and all that. That brings me to another point too. Um, a lot of uh, uh, designers obviously use grid paper. That's clearly in Photoshop. You can add the grid, which helps with proportions and stuff. Say all that. You want to just scrap it. Say, I don't want to mess with it. That's okay. Um, digital design can still help you out. There's some really amazing programs out there. One of my favorite I want to show you guys is called Sketchbook Pro. And uh, people tease me. Um, one of my favorite ways to design swords is literally on my iTouch, uh, just by finger painting. Um, you can download this app for like two or three bucks. And uh, you draw one side, and it does a mirror image of the other. Um, and, you know, I find I, I, I end up with designs way different this way than I would on paper. Not necessarily better, not necessarily worse. It's just one more way to just get that kind of, you know, the, the creative juice is flowing faster. That's all I really care about. There's no uh, superior uh, art medium. It's just, you know, how can I get the kind of mythopoetic uh, ideas I have in my head out and uh, listen to my instincts, kind of, you know, just go at a gut level of what you think looks good. Um, and this is just one way to do that. Um, so it's called Sketchbook Pro. It's for the iPad, iPad, iPod Touch. Um, this is Dave Stevens' iPad. Or you can draw trolls. You know, it'll be a troll smith. That's totally fun as well. Um, the, the, the effect that does the mirror imaging is really straightforward. You can see... Um, it, would, it just saves you a lot of time in, a, in, a, in attacking a design. Um, got it right here. It's, it's very nice on, on a Wacom, obviously, more than finger painting. Because um, you can do something so simply and so quick. Um, this is going to be the world's greatest sword in three seconds. But you get the picture. It, it, it helps your brain move at a pace that you don't normally on paper. Sometimes it's, it's good to, to work on paper. Sometimes it's, <laughs> sometimes it's good to work at this pace. Um, last night, me and uh, Peter Johnson and Michael Pakula uh, were talking about uh, this kind of word we're throwing around, uh, mythopoetic. This is a word I've totally pr plagiarized off of Tolkien. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's really important. We're talking a lot about the deeper meaning of the sword and what does it stand for. Um, I personally just love love the idea of uh, beautiful swords being in, in, intrinsic in our DNA. We just know them. We recognize them. Uh, they, they follow through evolutionarily or spiritually, culturally. Maybe it's in our, in our DNA. Um, I want to make swords that aren't historical but are somehow recognizable. Um, I think Tolkien hits upon that, you know, with his words, and I think like Jake put it beautifully earlier, we as bladesmiths are obviously not using words, but we want to be poets uh, with steel and with iron and with wood. Um, and uh, I want to get better at kind of trusting my primal instincts in, uh, in what looks good, because I think there's something there about familiarity that speaks to other people. Um, the culture you grew up in affects you a lot. It's funny, all of us talking about our backgrounds. I mean, I grew up on the, the peninsula uh, of Door County, Wisconsin in my summers uh, at my grandparents' cabin. And, and uh, there's, there's reproductions of the old urns churches uh, in, in Norway. And uh, actually, 
so I, I saw this stuff growing up a lot, the, the, the not work and the architecture and the, the music, the culture, the aesthetic really had an impact on me. Um, my favorite pancake place in Door County has really nice not work outside of it. Al Johnson's, if you're in Wisconsin, go there. Um, but it's true. I think uh, no matter what culture we come from, there's just something about tapping into the meta-narrative that's familiar. Tolkien said when he wrote Lord of the Rings, he didn't invent it. He, he plucked it off of the tree of tales. And that's why it's so familiar and, and, and it's cross-cultural. You know, it doesn't matter what your worldview is, you can relate to these truths because um, they're universal. And uh, we as bladesmiths obviously just want to do that visually. And my, my thought is the quicker I can do that, the quicker I can listen to my primal instinctual self and get this design out fast uh, is helpful. So whether that's um, through a modern you know, technology or just through pen and paper, I'm going to use uh, whatever means possible to get that uh, just very instinctual, gut level uh, inspiration out for other people to see and pick from and enjoy. Um, so that is that is uh, digital sword design, and uh, you can see the the, the finished results in uh, in my work. And uh, again, use these skills no matter who you are. If you're if you're a swordsmith, if you're a bladesmith, if if you're appreciator of swords, um, I'm sure a lot of guys who make knives and swords for a living would love it if their customers were more well educated and had a good design uh, uh, when they came to them uh, instead of just, just words to work with. Um, if someone came to me and had a beautifully designed sword, I would love that. You know, I want to I want to make their dream a reality and work with them. Um, so this is just one tool to make that happen faster, and you can have fun doing it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, what's the process like now that you've you've got these designs? What's what's the process like translating those into the object? Yeah. Um, I I again I'm not a numbers person, which I'm working on. Um, so I I do want to get to the point where I start designing my my swords in full scale. Um, but I just I attack things I ta attack things very intuitively, very organically. Um, so often I do skip the the, the Photoshop rend rendering aspect. I'll sketch something on the mm -hmm. train, and you know when I get to the forge, immediately try it and fail a little bit. But you know that's that's what designing mm -hmm. is for. Um, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, kind of. I was wondering. I mean, did you actually explode these and make a layout, or okay. is this yeah. just an image? Like sometimes I have a drawing. I just pin it up on yeah. the wall in my studio, <laughs> yeah. and it's not to scale, and mm -hmm. it's sort of, uh, it's a gesture yeah. of where I want to go with a piece. But it's there, and I look at it, and I think about it, and it informs me as I work. But I, I don't actually do big layouts. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, Jake does like the big full scale. Like, this is what it's <laughs> yeah. going to be. Which and is incredible. It's I, a cool approach, and I'm, you know, I'm going to have to try that. But it's not often what I do. So I'm kind of curious if yeah, I um, what your process is like there. Yeah, on the majority, I do just kind of rough something out and intuitively at attack it, you know, have the, the sketch pinned up on the wall in my shop and just go for it. Um, but it seems like, you know, all, all sorts of artists and craftsmen and philosophers are on one extreme or the other, like very, you know, intuitive and primal or very, um, you know, planned out. And, you know, neither are wrong, neither are right. Mm. It's just finding that, that beautiful balance. I'm very extremely on the side of just go for it. Mm. So I have to kind of recenter myself and, uh, you know, learn from all the incredible things that, uh, you know, like Jake and Peter and Don have taught us. Um, but I'm very just go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no prior planning. So. Okay. Cool. So, Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I learned a lot watching this. I also learned how much I have to learn. Photoshop. Photoshop. You see how quickly he was. This is how you can tell a true master at it with a tool. You know, Photoshop's a tool because he's just click, 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 click all over the place effortlessly. It reminded me of watching Michael McCool with his hammer. Yes. You watch the open. Yes. You watch the open fortune event. And Michael was like, do you show off. He was, doing this. he was he was going from he was on the bias and the flat and between hammer blows just as fast as you could. And that was the, the two different artists with two different tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks again, Dan. Thank you.